Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Lazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today we will perform a case study. So we'll talk specifically about a certain company and we'll have a review of how they have made it to put their products on the market. And this is the company Apos Therapy. And I have with me uh, Cliff Bluestein, uh, the CEO and president of uh, Apos Therapy. So Cliff, welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Thank you, Munir, for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Great. So, uh, Cliff, as usual, uh, can you make a small introduction of yourself, and then we can go more about uh, talking about Apple's therapy products? Sure. I'm Cliff Bluestein. I'm the president and chief executive officer of Apple's Therapy. Uh, I've been at the company now for more than three years. Uh, we're a global company with markets in the U.S., the U.K., and Israel. Good. Um, so. Um, actually, you are in the U.S., I suppose. So the, the headquarters is located in New York, if I remember. So our corporate headquarters is in uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, and our U.S. headquarters are in New York. Okay, great. Uh, so, um, Cliff, uh, as I've said, um, what is interesting with these kind of case studies is really to understand how a company uh, is really putting the efforts, for kind of the regulatory and maybe quality efforts, uh, to put these products on the market and maybe what kind of um, struggle you had to do that. So, but before maybe to go through that, so can we maybe help uh, the audience to understand what kind of products Apple's therapy is providing and so also which, what is the medical conditions that those people that are using those products have. Yeah, thanks. So we are a, a medical device company that sells a product um, that we call Apple's Therapy. It is a shoe-like device that looks like this okay. uh, with a shoe-like upper and then it has pods on the bottom part that are convex pods. Um, they're secured to the bottom of the device using uh, screws. We also have uh, spacers, wedges, and weights that are used in addition to it. Um, our product is used, uh, we are FDA cleared for knee osteoarthritis uh, with temporary improvement in pain and improvement in function. We are a non-FDA cleared general wellness device for chronic conditions such as uh, hip pain and, and back pain uh, as part of a healthy lifestyle. Uh, our product is used in collaboration with uh, partner sites. So you can typically uh, get Apple's therapy at physical therapy practices, orthopedic surgeons, uh, sports medicine doctors, and so forth. And when they see um, our patients, um, ultimately we have a pretty in-depth history and physical examination. We do a objective measurement of your gait or how you walk uh, using sophisticated um, gait mats and, and sensors. Uh, and then based upon the history, the physical, the visual gate assessment, we then uh, set up the device to personalize it to where your pain complaints are. And then patients use our device uh, typically for up to an hour a day as they're doing their normal activities at, at home or, or at work. No, it's great. So uh, it means also that uh, they cannot just buy these products from, from, from any shop, if I can say. They have really to go through a, a therapy that is really adapting that for, for the, 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 the patient, if I can say, uh, the, the, the patient feet or patient posture or, or whatever. So they have to do some measurement for that. So it's not like you just buy a product from the shop. It's really uh, something that is um, used in, in an healthcare, uh, healthcare facility, if I can say. Um, yes. In terms of uh, product, so this is not, um, so this is a product that you said that you are selling mainly in uh, the US, actually. You are also selling that in the UK, if I remember. So right. no, other, no other country, actually. So um, let's go maybe to the regulatory journey or the registration of these products in both uh, cases. So let's go for US first and maybe UK. So um, which procedure did you follow? I mean, what is the classification of these products first in, in, in the US? And which procedure did you follow specifically to register these products within, within FDA? Yeah, so um, all, all medical devices and, and companies that sell them must register uh, with the FDA. So if you think about it, there are several different regulatory agencies and within the different regulatory agencies, there are different departments within them. So. Our product falls in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Underneath that, you have the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration. Underneath that, you have the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. 
So that's the, the center that we sit in as a medical device company. Um, you need to register with the FDA. It's that part of the process is actually relatively easy. Um, you, it's all done online and, and you're able to register the name of your company, where it's incorporated, what the product is, and, and a whole bunch of categorizations associated with it. So it's relatively easy to, to register your product. And in essence, you have to pay uh, annual fees in order to maintain your registration uh, of your product. And the FDA does that because um, they want to know where your products are manufactured, um, how you bring them into the country if you're bringing them in from outside, and, and be able to contact you in the event that the FDA has some form of emergency uh, where they want um, increase in production. So coronavirus or COVID-19 is a perfect example where the FDA went to companies to, to increase the production or the manufacture of certain goods and services. Um, after you are um, registered, really what you have to then figure out next is, is what class is your device and, and why your class matters is that um, the FDA treats different class of devices differently based upon the um, risk associated with it. So the FDA's job in essence is to uh, demonstrate that the product is both safe and effective. Um, and it has multiple different pathways that it does that. The most common pathway used for uh, medical device manufacturers is the uh, 510K process, um, which is um, a process where you often give pre-market notification first. Um, there are companies that have medical products that are typically class one, some that are class two, that are in essence considered to be um, FDA exempted. Yep. meaning you do not have to specifically go to the FDA to achieve um, pre-market uh, clearance um, in order to bring your device to the marketplace. Um, and when you go to the FDA website, you can look to see um, if your product falls in a category that would be uh, classified as most likely class one or class two device uh, and is exempted from, from uh, pre-market notification. Yeah. Usually companies that go on that pathway are using what are called general wellness claims. Yeah. Uh, and general wellness claims are claims um, that are really broken down in, in, into um, two basic areas. Number one, um, are you encouraging a state of health or, or generalized wellness or, or activity? Or, or number two, um, by doing the activity, are you likely to uh, reduce the risk of impact of a disease um, when you're being active and the catchphrase is often as part of a healthy lifestyle? So that you, if you have a class one device, you can go to the market um, and publicize your device as uh, using any one of the general wellness claims. No, I think it's it's good because uh, I, I've said we have also this kind of classification in Europe, so it's class one. Also, it's like, I mean, the, the, what what we are saying many is that it's it's really a low risk. There is no no risk of death or risk of major injury, etc. So there is no need to put a lot of um, regulatory requirements, if I can say that. So yeah, the the FD has this uh, the the product uh, code that they are using, and then they define what is the the, the regulatory journey. So uh, in terms of your product, so um, as it is class one, as it is uh, kind of um, uh, you don't have to go through a, a full uh, review by the FD of all documentation. You still have also some. Um, some claims, if I can say for your product, to say that my product is doing this or is doing that. So what have you done, if I can say, to back up those claims? So do you have some, have you, do you have some clinical evaluations or looking at a predicate device or you have made yourself some clinical trials? Yeah, so when we first went to the market, um, our company used um, general wellness claims uh, to talk about our device as improving uh, people's uh, function uh, who have chronic pain as part of, of a healthy lifestyle. If you want to be able to use stronger claims than that, or, or in particular, once you are diagnosed with a disease, um, you more often than not have to go to the FDA in order to get regulatory approval to market your device for a specific disease. So when we looked at the history of the company, the body of research that we had, 
Um, we believe that we had a good chance of being able to get FDA clearance for an indication of knee osteoarthritis. Okay. And, and the reason why we went after knee osteoarthritis is that um, that's the most common cause of knee pain, um, really, and, and it's the most common cause uh, for people to go on to have surgery of their knee. So we felt that it was important to be able to market our products specifically to patients who have knee osteoarthritis. Okay. Um, what I would clarify though is um, just because you are FDA exempt from having to go to the FDA to get their specific clearance um, for your product, that does not mean you still don't need to follow the FDA guidance. Okay. So you still have to follow um, all of the safety and efficacy um, aspects related to your product um, in case the FDA would want to inspect you to make sure that, that you actually meet the qualification of being exempt. So one of the things I would recommend to, to any company that's looking to get FDA cleared um, or any regulatory body cleared is to go through the process uh, that you would need to do as if you had to have clearance um, to make sure that you meet all of the requirements and that uh, from a regulatory perspective, you are at least getting in the, um, the habit of putting in standard operating procedures to make sure that you are following um, the rules to the best of your ability. No, I think it's, it's a good advice because, yeah, as you mentioned, there is a lot of companies that think that because they are class one or exempt, it means that for them, they have nothing to do. But there is, uh, as you mentioned, there is some guidance saying you still have to comply with this. You still have to comply with that. And, and they have to have a quality management system, as you said, SOP, et cetera. Um, I suppose that, yeah, if the, the risk is that if um, the FDA is coming and auditing those type of company and they don't are, they are not following those rules, um, they can stop their business immediately. So it's also something that uh, they have also to have in mind, if I can say. It's, it's not just the FDA that can do it. The Federal Trade Commission or the FTC can do it as well. So um, you have more than one regulatory body that actually monitors um, what you're doing. If you are marketing your material um, through almost any channel, whether it's digital, online, or more traditional marketing in, in playbooks and stuff, um, the FTC can come after you for false claims as well. Okay. So um, it's specifically, yeah, I mean, is it something that is initiated mainly by some customers that say, oh, I tried it, it's really not doing what it says, or it can be a competitor also, or how, how this can come? Yeah, it can come from anyone. Yeah. So <laughs> it can come from a competitor, it can come from a customer complaint, um, it can come from, you know, physicians. So any one of the, the partners or competitors that you have <clears throat> are able to lodge complaints about uh, unfair marketing or, or um, unfair advertising or untrue advertising. So it's important to try your best to stay within the rules and the guidelines. <laughs> Especially because, um, you know, when you look at the marketplace, the it, the rules are very clear, uh, but sometimes things uh, fall within the gray um, because yeah. it's, it's sometimes very hard to delineate exactly what you can and what you can't say. You know, our, our, we typically, before we release anything publicly, um, try our best to have everything reviewed by a regulatory lawyer um, to make sure that to the best of their ability and our ability, we are falling within compliance and falling within the rules of what we can and what we can't say. No, I think it's a, it's a good strategy because, uh, yeah, I mean, there is a lot of things that um, a, a certain word can say, so you have really to not have any ambiguity on that and uh, people have really to understand, uh, understand everything. Um, you, in terms of the U.S., so you are selling your products now, um, then I suppose you decide to go to the U.K. after that. Well, you know, in the U.S., let me just clarify further. You had asked about the 510K process. Yeah. So, you know, the 510K process is the process that we went by to get FDA cleared. Uh, in essence, what we chose to, to do it in two stages. The first was um, you have to pick a predicate device. Yeah. So in the 510K process, the predicate device is you say that your product is similar enough to another product out there that's already safe and effective. Um, therefore, you as a product are also safe and effective. Um, and in essence, we went through the 510K process. 
uh, to do that. When we picked a predicate and we submitted all of our research, um, we asked for a pre-market or, or pre-510K hearing or ruling. Okay. So in essence, what you can do is you can apply to the FDA um, before you do your 510K submission and you say, here's all of our research, here's all of our claims, here's the predicate device. Um, you are the regulators who are eventually going to review our 510K application. What do you think? I think it's, it's, it's great because, yeah, it's, it's exactly, I mean, this is something that FDA can do and Europe is not doing that. FDA is authorized to do that and you can have a pre-submission so you can have a meeting with them. I know that when I went last time on their website, uh, because of COVID-19, it's easier to catch them up uh, through a virtual meeting, like a Zoom meeting or whatever, but it's possible. So you can go and ask them okay, have this, is it fine for you or not? And this can give you a really good guidance to say you are in the right direction or not, or maybe you have to change things. And it, did it help you? And we found it extraordinarily helpful. And not only did we find it incredibly helpful, um, my recommendation would be that you have the option to have a one hour meeting with the FDA as well. I would avail yourself to go ahead and actually have that meeting because what the FDA does is with your submission, they will give you written feedback um, related to the, the parts of your application that they may have questions. Um, sometimes um, their feedback um, is because you didn't do a good enough job of explaining your device or, or explaining the research. And it allows you an opportunity in person to talk with the regulators and explain um, our point of view around their questions and, and to some extent, you can um, get clarification of what their question is. So sometimes you think that they're asking you one question, but in reality, uh, the point of their question was something else. So the opportunity to be able to speak with the regulators that wrote the questions is, is awesome because getting that clarity um, before you write your 510K application allows you to answer the questions that they have, answer the concerns that they have, um, and, and write the application in a way which is more likely than not to result in a, a positive uh, outcome uh, than probably would have happened otherwise. So while it is more expensive to do the process because you're in essence doing two applications, you're doing one application, which is almost as much work as the 510K, uh, and then you are leveraging that one for the next piece with, with clarification. So, I, But I think that um, it, my advice for another medical device company is if you're going down this road, you should uh, use that as an opportunity uh, all, all of the time because it, it will give you um, a, a lot of benefit. I think it's clear. I, I know a lot of companies are not using that. They are, why? Because they are afraid that maybe FDA point out something and discover something which maybe be, can, can use that for later. So uh, maybe it's also something that they are afraid of. But here, yeah, it's really um, a free consulting, if I can say, from the FDA. Uh, you should really take that and use that and, and, and try to, to take all the benefits, uh, benefits from it. But um, did you had any, I mean, after that, was it easier then to submit and to go through the process or it took the same time for you? No, I mean, listen, we, we had already done the vast majority of the work for the pre-notification. What the extra work was, was to get the additional information to clarify um, our document. I, listen, I understand the risks that people are concerned about in going to the FDA for a pre-market notification. But the truth is the FDA is going to give you the same advice, whether yeah. you go to them preliminarily or, or you learn about it in your 510K application. And our point of view of that was I would rather have them tell me that we are not sufficient in certain areas and be able to fix that before I did my 510K than to submit the 510K and have them deny it. So, so I don't think the risk is any different whether you do it one way or, or you do this additional step. I think you actually de-risk it because you, know, you actually understand what the FDA's you know, pain points are. Um, but it, it wasn't any easier or not. I think people have to remember that this is a, a highly regulatory driven process 
which requires forms to be submitted the way that they want to see it, not necessarily the way you would like to present it. So we found it, um, we didn't need consultants, but, but our regulatory lawyers were very good at helping us to craft the message and, and craft the document and put it into the form and a function so that we didn't get booted out based upon a technicality because we didn't check off one box or, or fill in the, the component piece like they wanted to see it. No, so I think you, it's good. Yeah, uh, so you need help. In, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the 510K, so um, as you've said, you use the predicate. So did you use only the data from this predicate device or you created your own data for your product? Yeah, you know, for us, it was a little bit different. The FDA in the pre-submission told us that they didn't like any of the predicate devices that we picked. Okay. Um, and they basically said that we were substantially equivalent to the regulation for limb orthosis. So if you look at the FDA's website, we're actually cleared not to another um, device per se, we're actually cleared to the regulation. So okay. because we meet the definition of the regulation, they actually allowed us to get clearance based upon a regulation, not some other device. I think when it comes to the research environment, it, it, you have to have the research to support that you're both safe and effective. I mean, that, that, that's very clear from the FDA. And in terms of um, your data, so did you create some clinical trials for your product? Yeah, we're fortunate in that we are a company um, that is, has a very rich history of research. So going into the FDA, we had more than 50 publications. Now we have more than 60 publications. Um, the FDA looks at your research very similar to how some of the major medical journals do. So it's one of your research needs to be one of five different levels. Level okay. one is the highest level of research that you have. Typically, the FDA likes to see randomized, prospective, controlled trials um, that are ideally blinded both to the researchers and to the patients. Uh, they like large numbers of patients and obviously statistically significant outcomes. So when we went to the FDA, the basis of our FDA was a clinical trial that was done out of Bern, Switzerland on 220 patients. Um, and it was randomized prospective placebo controlled um, trial that was done independent of the company. So that was the basis of our FDA clearance. Um, they ask for an extraordinary amount of detail. So the FDA actually wants to review all of your source data. So they actually want to see the data on the individual patients and do independent statistical analysis to validate, you know, your analysis of, of the data. But if you have a really well-designed trial um, and you can run that trial by the FDA at the pre-market notification, um, they'll tell you whether or not they believe that that's probably sufficient or not. Okay. Um, during our discussion, uh, when we discussed about clinical trials, you told me something. You said to me that uh, there is also a disadvantage to start some kind of research like that um, when it's not you who is in control, but more the investigator. So what is this, that, what is this, um, this problem or this thing that can happen to you as a company? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think ultimately um, in any clinical trial, um, when you're doing research, it takes a lot of time. And, and the, the area that often takes the longest amount of time is recruitment. So getting patients to enroll in your clinical trial. So you obviously want to be able to um, have some control or manage the process in order to recruit patients to accelerate it. Um, when you have independent organizations that are doing the trial, um, it, it's a little bit harder to, to help with the recruitment. So you have to find partners that are very good at recruiting patients. You know, we were very fortunate that our partner um, in Bern actually was an excellent partner at recruitment and was able to get them for a long time. The biggest challenge I see in research is actually not an issue with your partners or the medical device company itself. It's really an issue of time. So these trials take a long time and the time between when you start a trial and it actually gets published uh, frequently is between four to seven years. Okay. So, so if I start a trial today and the outcome I'm looking for is one year, it may take an entire year or so to recruit enough patients. Then it takes another year or so to 
for the patients to run the course of the trial. It takes some time after that to process and analyze the data. And then after all of that is done, you then have to wait for it to get published, which can be another six months to a year or so for that to get published. So the challenge in research isn't the partners, the challenge isn't your, your product itself, the challenge is that it's just very, very time consuming. And, and ultimately, um, what the end game is, is to have multiple level one trials um, that get you to what we would call Cochrane level um, data. So have enough data of, of, uh, from really well run trials that when you go to payers, when you go to Medicare, when you go to the public, you can feel fairly confident that, that your product actually works and is well supported. No, I think it's it's really great. Um, this is, I mean, um, I mean, every company has this type of sugar. I think also that it can cost a lot of money for this company to really do that. So it's really a planning. It's really something that they have to to plan very well to to be really efficient. But yeah, if it's positive, then you get a lot of data that you can really use for registering your products, maybe all over the world. Um, when it's negative. Can you just say, okay, it's negative and you go to do something else or what is happening? Yeah, I mean, listen, we fortunately um, have positive trials, but um, if a company were to have a negative trial and you see this a lot in the pharmaceutical industry, that's a challenge for them because um, the product um, didn't help people enough that they were able to demonstrate statistical significance. I think... <clears throat> What you find within healthcare though, is that a negative trial actually probably doesn't necessarily mean that the product didn't work. Um, for many times, a negative trial could be because um, the patient population that was tested wasn't necessarily the one that, that the product is best fit for. So that, you know, there are many products, you know, if you think about any disease, you know, most people can go through a spectrum of severity to, from very little you know, pain or functional uh, abnormality to very severe where they actually need to have surgery. You know, people can run the spectrum. So for some companies, when they find into negative trials, my guess is as many of the times it's because of um, uh, the patient selection or the patient's population that they got wasn't uh, the ideal one for the product. No, I think it's it's a it's a great a great a great one because yeah, um, we should also see see some bright side on this and say it's maybe a failure now, but it can be a success. You have just maybe to change the parameters and find then, as you said, maybe the right population or or any other parameter that was uh, really not good for for that. Um, you know, and, and, I mean, listen, it, it's not really our issue, but you know, if you look at pharma, there have been some drugs that have become multi-billion-dollar drugs that. Um, did not perform as well as they would have expected for which they were designed. You know, the classic example is Viagra, which yeah. was originally designed to be, a, you know, a, a vasodilator, a pulmonary vasodilator, which it works, but it was much more effective at something else. Yeah, no, it's, good. it's completely true. Um, your product, as I've said, is in the US. Um, you also have your product in UK, so under the medical device directive now. Um, we know that there will be the new uh, medical device regulation that will come. Um, so it's a class one products in, in the UK. Uh, so there is no change, if I can say, with the new medical device regulation also. I suppose it will be class one. The only change is Brexit. I mean, you have by 1st of January in 2021, Brexit will hit, if I can say, uh, the UK. Um, what will change for you um, in terms of, of this, for, for your business in this, in this country? Yeah, you know, I, I, the answer is nobody knows yet because all the regulations haven't been completed yet. But for the most part, um, I don't believe there are going to be uh, many disruptions at all. I, I think um, most of the politicians we've spoken with want to have um, as little disruption as possible. I think for the most part, um, medical devices and, and medicine in general, um, there has been a greater trend to try and standardize regulations across different territories, where for the most part, um, regulatory bodies are asking very similar questions related to uh, safety and efficacy in, in the different markets. Um, and while every region may have some small nuances to it, I think there, you, you generally see pretty good consistency across different territories and the types of questions and the type of information that, and the type of data that they want. 
I think one of the nice things we're seeing about the globalization of healthcare is that um, clinical trials from other countries are much more readily accepted in, in, across geographies now than they probably have been in the past. And so I actually am not expecting um, that much in terms of changes um, before and, and after Brexit because I don't think it does anyone any good to have a radical change in, in the regulatory environment. And, and certainly um, none of the regulatory bodies would be in a position to reevaluate every single product that's already on the market with, with any form of new standard. So normally when, when organizations, whether it's the FDA or, or any of the European bodies are implementing uh, changes, um, they usually have a period of time to give you to prepare for whatever the changes are and, and get the documentation that you need in place in order to pass whatever the new requirements are. So, you know, our experience has been that, that regulatory bodies um, actually do a very good job of thinking through um, their requirements and, and new requirements. Um, while they may add something to the administrative burden, for the most part, you're given enough warning about it that you're able to do what you need to do in order to to continue to operate in those markets. Yeah, um, no, I think I think it's it's clear that uh, Brexit is uh, unknown for a lot of people. We are still waiting to understand how how they will what what should be applicable there. Uh, we hope we we receive the information as soon as possible because I think a lot of medical device manufacturers. I mean, everybody, not only medical device manufacturers, is really waiting to to understand how they can continue business without any disruptions. Um, as I you think, said, I think the more interesting question with Brexit though has to do not so much with the regulatory environment, but it has to do with the business requirement in the sense that for the most part, um, if you had a company that was incorporated in the UK or frankly in any of the European Union, for the most part, you could do business without any challenges in, in the other markets without having to necessarily set up a completely different business unit. Um, I think that um, that environment may change somewhat in the sense that the UK may be excluded from that and that if you were only based in the UK, but you're doing business throughout all of the European Union, um, you could potentially be um, in a better position to do business there if you opened up another corporate headquarters somewhere within, um, within Europe. So that you, you know, some companies um, may find it to their advantage or, or, or be encouraged to open up another uh, headquarters, another incorporated entity in, in order to service Europe as opposed to just the UK. Yeah, I, I think as you are only saying in the UK, so for you, it was really good because your uh, companies were mainly in the UK. But yeah, if you were using the UK um, companies to sell your products to Europe, maybe then it would have been um, better than to transfer everything there. Um, as we have, as you are, we are mentioning about the, the other countries, if we have Brexit, so uh, the Europe is now strengthening their uh, regulation with the new EU medical device regulation, UMDR, 2017-745. So for you as a, a president and CEO of a company, uh, would more regulation help you to do business or this would be maybe some kind of a, a break for you to say, okay, let's stop maybe to go to the European countries because it's more difficult to register my products there? Yeah, for the most part, um as a CEO of a company, I don't think about uh, the regulatory framework as my first decision point as to whether or not to enter a market. Okay. So the, it's not that the regulatory environment doesn't matter. Absolutely, it does. And I think the, the focus of this conversation has been about the importance of actually a regulatory environment. But when you're thinking about entering a new market and you're doing a global strategy, um, for the most part, people prioritize regions or markets um, based upon what the uh, opportunity is. So typically when you're doing your analysis of what is the size of the market, um, the U.S. market um, by far and away because they spend you know, double to triple what any other economy does uh, uh, on health care you know, to the tune of, of three plus trillion dollars, um, your largest market is going to always be the United States. Um, so that the biggest opportunity for growth is the United States. And in fact, the, the opportunity for growth from a revenue perspective in the United States is so big 
that if you are a business leader trying to make a decision about which market to enter, um, it's very hard to justify not um, investing in the United States uh, above and beyond other countries, just if you're looking at it as a pure economist. Um, I think when you're looking, uh, once you have entry into the US, you then look at other countries, or we've typically looked at other countries based upon what type of influence those countries have on, on others in the region. So um, many countries, um, even if the economic opportunity isn't um, as large as the US, are often bridges to, to other systems because those systems look to them for advice on what to do. So the UK is one of the countries that many other countries, uh, similar to the US, look to to see what are the new innovations, products, features, and functions that are being brought to the marketplace. And if adoption is really, really good in the UK, it often opens up opportunities in, in other areas such as you know, Australia, New Zealand, India, uh, parts of, of the European Union, um, where physicians um, often have very tight relationships in terms of the, the type of systems that they train under. No, I think it's it's good as you mentioned. So yeah, there there is really a, a good pathway here to say start with the US, go to UK, and there is also the language that is helping because it's the same language for the products, and maybe then going to to other markets that are really um, more beneficial. Um, so yeah, I, I think yeah, you really explained really well uh, all the the strategy for apost therapy. Um, this is really, I mean, for me, this is really interesting because you can hear what a company is doing. And what I like also talking with you is the fact that you are a president and CEO of a, a, a company in the US and you know about regulatory topics, regulatory pathways, all those vocabulary that we are using and which is not something I'm, I'm always seeing, which is really great. Um, do you have maybe some last advice to the people that are trying really to register their products in, in the US? As you mentioned, it's really maybe a big market. So is there some advice for them in terms of following the rules or following the regulatory pathways? Yeah, I mean, I think um, what we listen, nobody knows your product better than you do. Yeah. And because you are the one that are the experts on your product, I think you need to be prepared to invest a tremendous amount of time and energy personally in making sure that the regulatory process goes well. You obviously need to have either a good lawyer or, or a good consultant to help you to um, work through the process itself. But um, I have peers and, and we've seen it ourselves that if you are not willing to put in the time, energy and effort to actually go through and read every single line of, of the application that you're submitting and help to create um, all of the work product that goes into it, um, you are not setting yourself up for success. I can tell you that this process um, was an entire company-wide process. Everybody in my organization had a contribution to our FDA um, 510K submission um, because the level of detail that we had um, really uh, goes across all aspects of your company, including you know, manufacturing and quality controls, uh, understanding all of your designs uh, down to using your original drawings of, of how this is all manufactured. You, you need to have your clinical outcomes and all of your research trials already ready and prepared. We had training materials, so we had to um, generate and produce for the FDA all of the training materials that we had. Um, and to some extent, um, you even need uh, to make sure that you have all of the peripheral support that you, you have um, that the FDA looks at. So, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about different levels of trials, but the FDA now is increasingly starting to look at things that they call real world data. Yeah. Um, so whatever you're collecting in terms of real world data, you should also be prepared to submit to the FDA in a, in a very structured way. Um, you need to be tracking post-marketing surveillance for any complications or, or problems that you had, um, either to your device itself or, or just bad outcomes that patients have had. So you really need to pre be prepared to present to them everything. The advice is um, 
understand and plan for the fact that this is going to be a large project that is going to require bandwidth from your most senior leaders uh, within your organization. And, and it's not a minimal bandwidth. I mean, you know, I spent, uh, well, at the time I was the chief medical officer, but I spent personally, you know, 30 to 40% of my week for many, many weeks uh, preparing the materials and working with our uh, regulatory lawyers in, in order to get this, this through the process. So don't underestimate how much time, energy, effort, and commitment it's gonna take in order to go through the whole process. Uh, it, it is, it is a, a large endeavor um, and it's expensive. So you have to be prepared for um, paying your lawyers and paying your consultants uh, what it's gonna cost in order to bring this to fruition. And, and as you said, um, Research trials are also expensive, and, and a good trial can cost a company easily um, north of five hundred thousand to two million dollars or more. I think one of the, the lessons um, that people can learn is is that another way to leverage the FDA is even before you start your clinical trial. So one way to go to the FDA in a pre market way is you can actually present your research. Um, protocol to the FDA and you can say to the FDA, here's how we want to run our research trial. If we want run our research trial in this way, are we giving you all of the information that you're going to want to need and ask their advice if there's anything else you should be doing in your clinical trials before you even start them. So my recommendation would be um, get involved very early, um, go to the FDA frequently, um, bring your clinical trials to them before you even start them to make sure that at the end of this two-year journey or three-year journey or four-year journey, the outcomes that you get from that trial um, uh, meet all of the needs of the FDA uh, and, and you know, understand this is a process and it takes time and you, know, you have to be prepared that the FDA is going to throughout the process, send questions to you that you need to efficiently respond to. No, I think it's great. So really thank you, Cliff, because as I said, you have you as I said, you are the CEO president of Apos Therapy and you are really knowledgeable on all those uh, regulatory and quality uh, facts. And it's really something that I'm not seeing a lot. So really thank you. Thank you for, for that. Um, great. So I think yeah, we covered really all the topics that we wanted to discuss uh, today about Apos Therapy. Uh, so if you want to go and see more about this uh, this company, I will put the, the website of the company on the show notes. So please go and look at the products and look at all, also the, the the elements that we talked today uh, with uh, with Cliff. Uh, so um, if you are listening to this podcast on uh, on the um, uh, on your podcast provider, so don't hesitate, please, to provide a review. And if you have any questions, so let me know. I will send that directly to to Cliff. Uh, if you are on YouTube channel, so please don't forget to provide a, a comment or a like, uh, and then uh, we'll also provide your question to Cliff if, if I receive anything. So so Cliff, I really thank you for uh, for participating to this uh, to this episode. Really Really thank you for all the advice, all the knowledge that you provide to us. I hope this will help also other manufacturers that are trying now to register their product within the US uh, and helping them also to understand what is really the journey and what are uh, the things that they have to do. And really thank you for all the advices. Okay, so Cliff, really thank you and I wish you a nice day. Thank you. Take care, Bye-bye.